Hi, I'm Mitch Gallagher. Welcome to Sweetwater's Guitars and Gear. Since this is our first Guitars and Gear video for 2017, Don Carr and I thought we'd sit down and have a little conversation with you about how to improve your tone in 2017. So we've got 10 tips coming at you for ways to improve your tone, both from your rig and from a playing standpoint, and maybe we'll even drop a bonus in there as well. So Don, there's all kinds of aspects that go into creating a great guitar tone, right. everything from the gear to how you play. Right. One that I think a lot of players miss is figuring out what they want beforehand. No kidding, man. You, you've got to have a target to aim at, right? Exactly. You know, um, and whether whether your reference is you like the way someone else sounds, mm -hmm. or you like a recording you've heard, or you you like the way a guitar feels, but you got to have a starting point and then a direction to go to for sure. Right. You kind of got to have a oral picture, if you will, in your yeah. mind's ear right, of, right. Uh, of what you're aiming right. for, so that you can start dialing your amp, start mm -hmm. dialing your uh, your uh, guitar and things. So, so how do you go about arriving at that yourself? What's your process? Man, you know, being a guy that has to come up with a lot of different stuff, I have to look at it on a case-by-case -case basis. You know, so you're either going to, in a situation where you want to be super versatile, you want to maybe pick a rig, guitar, amp, pedals that do a lot of things at least pretty well, mm -hmm. and maybe one thing exceptional. You know, and so you've got kind of a good basis from there. But, man, most of the time I'm looking at it case-by-case. -case. You know, I'm right. looking at it like, okay, this is clearly a Gretsch guitar and a Tweed amp. You know, and that's the sound that's gonna that's gonna nail this. Right, right. Then the next thing is a rock song, and you've got a Les exactly. Paul and a Marshall. And the exactly. next song is a country song, mm -hmm. and it's a Telly and a Blackface mm -hmm. Fender. Or whatever yeah, the right thing. tools for the job. You know, basically. Right, right. My approach is a little different because mm -hmm. I tend to do my thing. Right, you know, right. I, I play in a band where we do covers, but mm -hmm. it's still where we don't try to replicate the record. We're exactly. doing our take on it, so yeah. we kind of each try to go for our own sound. And then when I'm recording my own music, it's you sure. know you're trying to find yeah. your tone. Yeah, and it's, it's your even, voice at that point. Right, yeah. exactly. And it's even harder in that case sometimes to have a picture in your mind of what you want to hear because I have all my heroes mm -hmm. that yeah, I want to sure. that I want to capture the, you know sure. the essence of their sound and yeah. their approach and things. So yeah. that can be the challenge. It is, man. It's completely different if you look at things like. Uh, from the aspect of being the artist, if mm -hmm. you will, you know, if you're if you're the artist, then you've got to find that particular voice that you speak and that you know sounds great, you know, it feels great, feels natural and normal, and more importantly, it's got to be convincing. Right. <laughs> you know. Right. right. Absolutely. Well, let's start talking about some of the specifics. Okay. I mean, obviously, one of the big things you can do to change up your tone or to hopefully improve your tone mm -hmm. is to get a new guitar. Oh yeah. Clearly. So how do you go about? yourself, yeah. when you're looking at getting a new guitar, what is it that draws you to an instrument from a tone standpoint? Ooh, from a tone standpoint. Right. Well, <laughs> you know, I mean, okay, we're always looking for big, fat, clear, round, articulate, you know, no matter what that particular voice is, whether it's a Tele, mm -hmm. you know, or a Stratocaster, or a Les Paul, you know, or a seven string, or whatever it is you're looking for, you want that. I mean, right. or, or I should say, I want that. I want that big, brown, fat, articulate, clear tone. Right. I think it's easier to take a guitar that sounds big mm -hmm. and make it sound small oh, yeah. than it is to take a guitar that sounds small and mm -hmm. to try and make it sound bigger, to somehow mm -hmm. blow it up. Yeah, exactly. If, if you will. Exactly. So I'm, I'm kind of with you on that. The other thing that I look for is, particularly with a solid body electric guitar, mm -hmm. is that it responds really well acoustically. Yeah. To me, yeah. if it sounds great acoustically, I can pretty much guess that it's going to sound great from an electric standpoint. Right, right. It's going to sound great plugged in, especially if the pickups are, you know, what you think they are, what you want them to be, or, you know, what they're as advertised, or, you know, you know what I mean. So a great test is just to, you know, play the guitar acoustically and see how it feels, see if it resonates, see if it rings, see if every note feels even. Mm-hmm. Right, right. That's, that's all important kind yeah. of kind of stuff. And then you can start to dig in mm -hmm. and plug it sure. in, obviously. Sure. And make sure that what you're you're hearing acoustically translates into the electric world as right. well. Right. As well. Um, I also find that you mentioned resonance, and I think that's really an important feature in a guitar yeah. that it really rings. And it's funny because I'll play a guitar and it'll feel kind of dead to me. Somebody else will play it and they'll be like, "This is just a live <laughs> instrument." A lot of it has to do with your touch. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. That's true. It does. Um, the, you know the. And, and that gets really, really super minute because it's like how you attack the string and how your fingers lay on the string and how you release the string as well. It has so much to do with it. Right, so. right. And a lot of factors you can do to tweak the guitar once you have it. Mm -hmm. But finding that good bass tone yeah. out of the instrument is really where you want to start. And we're going to yep. talk about some of those other aspects as well. Yep. Number three on our list of ways to enhance your tone in 2017 is with a new amplifier. You've got a new guitar or you've got a guitar that's working great for you. The amp is an equally large part or sometimes even a bigger part of the equation. Yeah, it certainly can be. And and again, that, that gets into a stylistic thing, mm -hmm. you know, because obviously the amp does a lot more than just 
recreate the sound of the guitar or represent the sound of the guitar. I mean, there's a lot of the tone that happens in the amplifier. Right. Right. I think of tone, and, and we've had this conversation, and actually I, I go through this when I, I teach some of our Sweetwater University classes yeah. as well, or when I hold my workshops on tone, yeah. that there are kind of four food groups of amplifiers. Mm -hmm. And I kind of divide things that way. There's the Vox group, the Fender mm -hmm. group, the Marshall group, and right. the modern group, if you will, yeah. the high gain group. And uh, amplifiers tend to fit into one of those groups, and you need to either find an amplifier that's in the food group mm -hmm. that you're family. after, yeah. or one that can cover all of those if yeah. you're in a studio situation like right. yourself, right. That, uh, that you can then choose and you can pair with the guitar. And I think that's an important part of it as well, is pairing the guitar with the amplifier. Yeah, no kidding, man. It's amazing how certain amps respond, well, we've seen this so much, how certain amps respond better to single coils, some amps respond better to humbuckers, some do well with both, but it's a different flavor or a different character depending on the guitar and the amount of output. Right. And yeah, I mean, it's, you know, definitely wide range there. And then you look at, do you want an amplifier, like for example, we were just playing through the uh, 57 uh, Custom, the, oh, new, the yeah, new Fender the 57 Custom Tweed. Which are yeah. amazing, tweed, tweed style amplifiers. Yeah. I mean, they just nail that thing. Mm -hmm. But that's never going to be a high gain amplifier, and it's not supposed to be. No. It's great at what no. it does. Yep. We've seen other amplifiers that do everything mm -hmm. really sure. well. Sure. So then you have to look at which of those approaches is right for you and what you're trying to do. Right, right. What, work, what fits your workflow and what makes sense for what you want to hear ultimately at the end. I mean, uh, you know, taking a, a look at an amp like the, you know, the Hughes & Kettner Grandmeister 40. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a one amp, does it all kind of amp. Right, you know? right. And it does everything really yeah. well. Right. Really well kind of thing. But again, if you want that super targeted, mm -hmm. vintage style tube amp where the power amp is really contributing a lot to the tone, right. you're going to want something more right. like that 57 Custom. Oh, absolutely. Because that's going to uh, to really be in that family or mm -hmm. that, that food group kind of thing. If you want the bright, chimey thing, maybe it's a Vox style amplifier right. or one of the, sure. the boutique versions of a sure. Vox. And certainly, uh, there's a whole world of uh, Marshall style vintage oh, amplifiers, man. let yeah. alone the high gain things yeah, right. out there. So that, that is really fun, checking out all the different amplifiers and all the different things that they can do. It is, man. It is. And, and you know, it's like uh, never underestimate the way an amp is voiced, you know? I mean, because they're with looking at an amp like, uh, like the stuff that Boogie makes, mm -hmm. particularly where you can swap power tubes and change power sections and, you know, you can change the voicings on the, uh, um, on the individual channels. I mean, wow. Just, right. you know, a huge wide range there. Right, right. A tremendous amount of, of things there. And, of course, an amplifier is a system. Yeah. So sure. we also talk about speakers, mm -hmm. we talk about the different tubes and things. Mm -hmm. So let's move on to that, actually. Yeah. Number four on our list is changing up the tubes in a tube amplifier. Obviously, you wouldn't do that in a solid state or a modeling yeah, right. amplifier. <laughs> right. wouldn't, wouldn't get you right. very far. <laughs> well, that, actually, that's not true. If you're in a modeling amplifier, a lot of them will allow you to actually change the type well, of tubes true. or power that's section. Well, that's true. That's true. Yeah, you can change the whole character of the power section. Right, you know? right. Yeah. We came in uh, a couple weeks ago on a Saturday afternoon, mm -hmm. and we set up in Sweetwater Studio A, yeah. and we had four amplifiers there, four pretty much identical amplifiers. And we started swapping tubes. Yeah. And it was amazing. It really was. It was astounding not only changing um, the, uh, you know, the power section tubes mm -hmm. and listening to the sound of the different power sections with different tubes in them. But, man, when, when we got that little tube cocktail where we had the right uh, tube in the first preamp socket and, wow. And a different yeah. tube in the second right. socket. And mm -hmm. It was really just surprising. Had a slightly different feel. But, boy, just the amp just all of a sudden came to life, you know. Right. And it actually yeah. really made it clear to me that you don't have to go with all, like in, a, in that particular case, mm -hmm. I think we had four preamp tubes in that particular right. amplifier. Right. And they don't all have to be the same tube. Right. Because we had one tube in the first slot, mm -hmm. different tube in the second slot, mm -hmm. and that was the magic combination, exactly. was finding the right ones to balance there. Well, and back to that uh, 57 Custom, um, the, uh, the in very something very different that I was really surprised about, um, the first two tube sockets are uh, AY7s, oh. which are way lower output. Yeah, right. So you would think that you'd normally want you know, a higher gain in the, uh, in the first socket to hit everything a little bit harder, but with this, you know, more clarity, more headroom. Certainly with exper worth experimenting with. Yeah, right. That would mm -hmm. certainly force the amp to, if you're going to drive it into distortion, mm -hmm. it's going to come from the power amp right. and not from the preamps, which is right. a very different kind of a yeah. sound. Yeah. And that's something you want to get yourself familiar with, mm -hmm. is how does preamp distortion sound compared to power amp distortion? Oh, yeah. and, and that gets into how much power can you get away with having. Yeah, right. You know, I use a 30-watt amplifier yeah. On, yeah. on my gigs, and you use a small amp as well. Right, I use And a lot of that is being able to, to push up the master volume. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to get the master volume where, where the amp's just starting to cook a little bit. It feels really good. Well, um, another great example, that Supro Comet. Mm -hmm. You know, little tiny amp. You can just... You know, you can just dime it, and it just right. sounds great, and it's just it's as huge as it's going to be. But in in the you know in the grand scope of things, it's kind of small sounding, which is great. It fits right. in the mix well, really well. Well, it's low well. volume anyway. Yeah, right, right, exactly. <laughs> low volume, but it fits in the mix really well. Yeah, too. right. It's really tight and contained. Yeah. You know. 
Yeah, sometimes going for for a tone that has a ton of low end to it yeah. isn't always the right thing to do, and you right. know this from all your studio sure. experience. Sure, you end up cutting a lot of that stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, getting yourself a nice, mm -hmm. tight, contained tone mm -hmm. will a lot of times sit in the mix better. Yeah. Allows room for everybody else. Exactly. And then everything sounds bigger. So, and next on that line after tubes, we've also experimented a lot, both of us, with changing speakers and amplifiers. Yeah. And that that's a place where you can really really fine-tune the response and the tone of the amplifier. Mm -hmm. You sure can. It's really obvious to me, you know, that it's the last thing in the chain. Mm -hmm. So it's the thing that absolutely reproduces the sound. It's the last thing that everybody hears. So, right. you know, that that's really where the tone is just finally concocted. Right. You know? Right. And it's, of course, it's a combination of the cabinet sure. and the speaker driver. Sure. What we're kind of specifically oh, yeah. speaking about is the driver itself. Right. And, uh, you know, we both have found our favorites for certain things, but it's not the same speaker in every amp. No, not at all. And a lot of times you want a brighter speaker in a dark amp, mm -hmm. or you're trying to tame some high end. Mm -hmm. So you want something that'll break in and sound a little bit warmer, sure, a little rounder. Sure, And, you know, I, I, I love the difference in cabinets. Cabinet widths, sizes, depths, closed back, open back, half closed. You know, wow, man, it's... Right. It's, uh, yeah, it's pretty interesting. It really is. Yeah, it's all stuff that uh, when you can A-B those together or mm -hmm. even just get a chance to plug different things in yeah. and listen to them, you can really, uh, really starts to hone your perception yeah. of what's right. happening with your rig. Right. And it's not actually one of our tone tips here, one of our 10 tone tips, but a part of that as well is the microphone you put in front of that speaker. Oh, gosh, yeah. You know, are you going to use a ribbon microphone? Mm -hmm. or are you going to use a dynamic, a condenser mm -hmm. mic, a combination of the two? Exactly. Whether you're recording or on stage, microphone makes a big difference. Oh, man, it sure does. And, uh, you know, close mic, distant mic, um, you know, you, phasing issues, making sure all that's at least right to begin with, but then right. beyond that, you know, what what is it actually doing? Number six on our tone hit list is cleaning up your signal path. It's surprising how much plugging in a pedal or a cable mm -hmm. or a different routing or a mm -hmm. pedal board or whatever can really affect your tone. And what's surprising is a lot of times you don't notice it because in the moment or as you just over the course of time, you add more and more things together until one day you plug your guitar straight into the amp and you go, Wow. <laughs> That's what I wanted to sound like. Right. What happened? Right. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. right. So there are ways you can optimize your signal path. Yeah. What are some things that you do to, uh, to try and keep things clean when you're setting up a pedal board? Well, uh, you know, shortest cable possible. Mm -hmm. That's the first thing. Um, best possible power supply, you know, to do the job that needs to be done. Right. Um, and that doesn't do so much to the actual signal itself, but boy, it can sure clean up, you know, 60 cycle and any kind of ground buzz or hum or anything like that, uh, which, you know, as we know, contributes greatly in the, in the final analysis, you know, it really right. makes a huge difference. Um, another thing too is I go through my, I, I do things one at a time, plug one pedal in, listen, plug another one in, listen, mm -hmm. plug another one in, listen. And then if things start to go south, you know, at any given point, it's like, oh, okay, that's the problem. Right. How do we fix it? Right, right. You had a case the other day where you, you came into my office and you're like, man, I plugged in this pedal. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, my tone is totally different. Yeah. And yeah. I, I had used similar pedals and right. I had no problem at all. And, right. And after some troubleshooting, you found it wasn't actually even the pedal. Yeah, right. It was a cable. Right. It was a cable. Yeah. Right. Yeah, which is, which is insane because it was like, this cable was working a minute ago. Wait a minute. It's not now. What You know. Right. But, but that's that process of elimination where you just have to always work backwards and go, okay, well, this is, this is good. We know this is good. We know this is good. Where is the problem? Right. Right. If you're a science nerd, you know that scientific method, right? Yeah. Of right. just changing one right. variable as, right. you, as you go along. Yeah. But something else we should talk about here, and that's... Uh, true bypass pedals mm -hmm. versus buffered pedals. Yeah. Now, where do you stand in the whole debate? Well, you know, the the thing that I've found, and I've, we've had this discussion many times, but but the thing that I've found is that is that true bypass is great for the most part. Um, you're going to have to have a buffer at some point mm -hmm. because you've got your cable, which is, say, 10 feet, and you've got the other cable to the amp, say that's 10 feet. Well, all of a sudden, that's already you're at 20 foot of cable, right. which for high impedance is about all you want to do. And then you start putting pedals in the middle of it. Every one of those, the circuitry, even though you're bypassing past it, it's still, you know, there's a connection there. There's two yep. connections. And so every one of those counts as an extra few inches or and then eventually you've got a couple more feet in the middle, of all of that. Right. You're going to have to have something to drive that signal down that path. Right, right. I've gone to, uh, well, I should say that, that my, where I stand on it is I like to have a buffer at the beginning, mm -hmm. true bypass pedals in the middle mm -hmm. if possible, mm -hmm. and then a buffer at the end. Yep. So that you're kind of setting things up and keeping it clean. Yep. And actually the solution I've been going with lately that's kind of revolutionized my, my pedal board is a uh, 
Bossy S8 switcher. Oh, yeah. Which has two yeah. buffers, and you can turn right. those on and off. And so depending on what pedals you have, what right. loops are on, you right. can set all that stuff up. And, and uh, it just makes a huge difference in keeping the cleanest possible signal path. Mm -hmm. Because it's almost like, as well, it's, it's basically a mixer. Mm -hmm. You know, as if your signal's coming into the ES8 and going out the ES8, and everything that happens in here is about as neutral as it's going to be. Right. You know, yeah, I'm, I'm same way. I've got a, uh, how am I doing this? I've got, oh, I've got a wah pedal, which has a really nice buffer in it, uh, in my input and then my output stage. I've got a volume pedal, which is buffered. Right. So, so you're covered on, on yeah, both sides of the right. equation. Right. That's my, that's my live rig. And for the studio rig, I'm using a switcher as well. So. Right. Right. And of course, the S8 is just one example. There yeah. are lots of different sure. switchers. There are passive sure. switchers. But any way you can minimize mm -hmm. the amount of cable that's in there mm -hmm. and the uh, the amount of connections, I think yeah. that's a great point. Yeah. Daisy uh, chain, you know. Exactly. That's, that's tough. Exactly. Yeah. can really help to, to clean things up. Since we're talking about pedals, that's next on our list. And that's adding new pedals to your rig. Yeah. And this is something, man, you do so many pedal <laughs> demos. You check so many things out. Yeah. It's got to be like kid in a candy store. Which one do I buy next? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Exactly. I'm like going, man, I hate when I do a demo and I really like a pedal. What do I do now? The dilemma. Ah. <laughs> yeah. But that's something, though, where, where um, you know, I, I, people mock me sometimes <laughs> because I don't think I've ever done two gigs in a row where my pedal board has been the same <laughs> for, for two know, gigs right. in a row, you know? Right. Because it's just man. always something new to put on there and always something yeah. better. But that's that eternal quest, right? To yeah. have the best possible tone. Sure. Sure. And you're just always finding pedals that work. I found one just a couple weeks ago that I'm just in love with. Oh, the, yeah. The Shinjuku yeah, pedal right, from, right, from MXR, which I think right. is just awesome. And uh, so that had to go onto my board. So, <laughs> you know, that's, that's just what you do. I know. I know. I just got a Mobius the other day, man. Same thing. Yep. You know. Yeah. yeah. But it's also a matter of finding the pedals that are going to work for what you want to do. Right. And again, looking at that combination of true bypass and mm -hmm. buffered, maybe you want all sure. buffered. There's, a, there's certainly a tone there as well. Oh, yeah. Uh, that, that can work. But the types of pedals that you're using and where you're placing them in the signal path, are they going in front of the amp? Are yeah. they going in the effects loop? Mm -hmm. you know, sometimes you can experiment with that, and it's surprising. Sure. Yeah. I had a pedal I was using for, uh, for uh, rotating speaker effects, for Leslie effects. Right. Right. And I had it in the effects loop, which is where you'd assume it would be yeah. after the, uh, the distortion. Sure. And it just was not working. Moved it in front of yeah. the amp. Sounds yeah. glorious. Just yeah, absolutely right. love it. So right. that's an example of I might have gotten rid of that pedal. Yeah, because it right. just wasn't doing it. But uh, tried it in a different place and it worked fine. And it sounds yeah, it sounds completely great. Um, I you know me compressor pedals. I mean I love compressor pedals early in the signal chain. Mm -hmm. You know at, because it it ends up being you can use it like a boost pedal. You sure. know it, it can drive an overdrive channel or you know a drive pedal. Um, you know and and it and when those are out of the chain and you're using a clean signal, it's a clean boost at that point as well, and your compressor. So you know, right. again, placement is really key, really right. critical. Right. So I don't use my compressor that way, so it's a yeah. little different kind of a thing. But it points out mm -hmm. the question is where are you getting your volume changes from? Sure. Where you're getting your gain from? Mm -hmm. Is it coming from the amplifier? Yep. Are you using overdrives? Do you have a you, you have a variety of different overdrives right. that you use on right. your board to yeah. uh, to get different tones and things? Yeah, yeah, and I like doing stacking and you know that sort of thing too. That's why I like that. Uh, um, I like that flex drive, the Mesa flex drive, because mm -hmm. it's just transparent enough, but it's just gainy enough that you can use it on either end of another drive pedal. So it can boost one or be boosted by another one. So it's you know right. really super versatile. Right. Yeah, that, that works really well. Yeah. Really well for you. One we've both been enjoying is the uh, the uh, the Wampler, the Tumnus. Oh gosh. Pedal. Yeah, just for a transparent kind of clean overdrive <sighs> as well. Yeah. So you just has so many great choices. Out yeah. There. Yeah. It really is. Yeah. But that's that's kind of uh, well, I find that just a fun. Yeah, you know, it to, is. To hear the different ones. It and is. They make you play different. They sure and so do, man. That gets back to your having a picture in your head of what mm -hmm. you're trying to achieve. What mm -hmm. kind of a tone do you want to have? Right, right. And uh, and uh, again, this isn't one of our one of our ten uh, list of ten, but the amount of gain that you're using makes a huge difference oh my gosh, as yeah. well. You sure know, does. you certainly can push yourself into high gain territory, but you have to be careful mm -hmm. not to get into that mosquito tone. Right. Kind of yeah. Territory. Exactly. Either the mosquito tone or the super woofy tone. One of the two it can right. go the opposite direction as well, and then. You know, and either way, you're not cutting through the mix right. Right. Unfortunately. And the key to, to recognizing that is to get down and actually listen to your amplifier. Yeah. You know, right. Your, right your, your ears it. aren't on your ankles. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know? Have the thing pointed at your head so you can actually hear it. You actually yeah. hear what's coming out of there. Yeah. And maybe maybe you still want to have it at your you know low down on the floor, so right. you're getting that that uh, response from the floor, that yeah. extra boost to get from the floor, and also so it's not killing you with volume or sure. whatever. Sure. But you got to actually hear what's coming out of your amp in order yeah. to make those tonal decisions. Oh, yeah. Absolutely, man. And uh, you know and even going uh, a step beyond, you know, thinking about uh, like modulation effects and delay effects, and you know, there's such a 
ridiculous plethora of stuff out there now. I mean, the 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 range is just amazing, and the combination effects. You know, a lot of companies have things that have you know delay and verb together, and you know, and mod and you can modulate a verb or you can modulate a delay, and it's like. That, again, that gets back down to the workflow. You know, right. what works for you? What kind of sounds are you trying to make? You right. Know? I've been finding, actually, it's interesting that uh, I've got some kind of general purpose. For example, delays. I've got a yeah. general purpose delay that sure. is connected by MIDI to my switcher, mm -hmm. and it changes and gives me a sure. variety of things. But in certain cases, I want to hear a specific delay. For example, I find the Shinjuku I mentioned mm -hmm. earlier yeah. is a perfect match with a carbon copy. Yeah. It just is the perfect delay right. with that. In right. some cases, I don't care about that. I just want to have the straight... Mm -hmm. Straight delay, you know, but yeah. uh, but there are pedals that go together really well. Oh yeah, and uh, having access to that, being able to step on both of those at once or have them in a loop, mm -hmm. you know, so you can turn them both yeah. on simultaneously, is a cool way to pretty dramatically shift your tone. Yeah, exactly, because a carbon copy sounds like itself. That's it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it you know, it has its own tone, which is a pretty astounding in the delay world to come up with something that you know original. But right, you know. Right. So, Dom, we've talked about guitars, we've talked about amps, we've mm -hmm. talked about different components in amps, we've talked about pedals, but something you and I actually have spent some time shooting out and listening to is cables. Oh, yeah, cables. Amazing. Yeah. You know, I've, I've, I've talked to naysayers who don't believe a cable makes much difference, but man, we sat down and blind tested and listened. And yeah, yeah, I know. Pl and just, I mean, a straight apples to apples comparison, you know, same guitar, same amp, same settings, same, same player. Same length of cable. Same length of cable plug it in and it was just astounding. It right. really was. And not always the most expensive cable that yeah. is the choice for a particular setup. Mm -hmm. Now typically I will go for a higher end cable myself mm -hmm. because sure. I, I like to eliminate that variable. I like to say, yeah. you know what, I've got a great transparent cable here. I know this is transparent. Right. It's not right. shaping my tone. Right. That's what I'll go for in most cases. Mm -hmm. But I also have a go-to cable that just rounds out the top end a bit. It's still a good quality cable, don't get right. me wrong. Right. But uh, I mean that was it was surprising we both ended up picking the same cable. Yeah. That was very balanced. Yeah, yeah. And it's funny too because, you know, our, our approach is different, you know, that our you know, our choice of kind of tone things are different, you know, not not wildly different, but still right. you know, different enough that it's like, wow, that's amazing that that one cable really fit both of us. Right, know? and it's a medium price cable. I, yeah. I, won't, I won't even mention the cable because yeah. it really doesn't matter. Nah, it's irrelevant. Because the cables all are just kind mm -hmm. of, they have a tone to them. They do. So what I'm tending to go for in my rig is I'm using that cable from the guitar into my pedal board. Right. The, the cables between my pedals or into my switcher yeah. are short. Yeah. They're not affecting things it's, too much. Yeah, I tend to go for a George deal. L's, mm -hmm. you know, a, a pretty sure. transparent cable. Sure. And then I'm going for a more balanced cable again, back to the amplifier. Yeah. Although sometimes I'll plug in a little bit brighter cable just to get a little bit more articulation. It depends on the guitar, it depends on the amp. Yeah, interesting. Wow. So you can get tweaky with this stuff. Yeah, <laughs> that, that's a fact, man. You can get way <laughs> tweaky with that stuff. Right. But if you want to eliminate or minimize the effects of your cables, yeah. first of all, go with a good high-end cable right. and keep it as short as possible. Mm, cable short, length. Yeah. Short as possible. That's That, to me, is probably the biggest single takeaway from a cable discussion is cable length. You know, mm -hmm. ten. I, I really like keeping cables at ten feet. Mm -hmm. You know, if at all humanly possible. Right. Or again, having a really good buffer. And there are some mm -hmm. great buffer pedals that, if yeah, you want to sure have a really are. dedicated buffer that's going to give you great tone, mm -hmm. works great in that situation. Yep, it'll, yeah, it'll push it down the length of that cable. Right. Where you don't get a loss. Right. Number nine on our list of ten ways to improve your tone on 2017 is one I know we're going to see in the comments below this video. Probably the first comment that's going to go up there is somebody's going to say. Mm -hmm. Practice. practice. Yeah, <laughs> practice. The tone is all in your fingers. Uh, it is. Well, well yeah, yeah, I mean, it, it is. It sure starts there. It sure does. Sure That's exactly starts right. starts there. But the key of this practice discussion and the key mm -hmm. of that whole thing is that we're not just talking about mindlessly playing scales while you're yeah. watching Big Bang Theory. Exactly. <laughs> you know, you got to actually exactly. practice your tone mm -hmm. with intent. And yeah. intent is an important word there. I've been hearing that a lot in my interviews that I'm doing with artists and stuff is to play with intent, approach music with true intent, right. and I think tone seeking is the same way. Yeah. There's a difference between just plugging into your amplifier and tweaking knobs and things, you know, moving things around and making that, that's sounds. All great. That's, that's yeah. great. You're experimenting yep. and you're, you're learning, mm -hmm. but a saxophone player, for example, will work on their tone. Right, right. A violin player or a cello player will work on their tone. A classical guitar player mm -hmm. certainly spends a lot of time working on tone production. Mm -hmm. There's no reason an electric guitar player shouldn't do the same thing. Exactly, because technique will create your tone, mm -hmm. for better or for worse. <laughs> right, right. I've been finding that uh, with that in mind, I've been slowing some of my practice down and mm -hmm. really focusing on maximizing the tone of each note. Yeah. And yeah. That, that translates to better technique, Sure. first of all, sure. but also just a lot better tone. Yeah, 
I, have, I couldn't agree more, man. I mean, it's it's really in the uh, you know right hand, left hand timing. Mm -hmm. You know, it's in the it's in the attack and the release. The, the, guitar players tend to forget about the release. You know, the release is really important. Mm -hmm. I mean, you don't you know you want to make sure that you hang on to the note for its full value. Right. You know, and and get to the next one at the you know the quickest possible interval. Right. Right. So you get that connected tone right. if that's what you right. want. Yeah. But at the same time, still have that articulation. Sure. You can actually go in and modify your technique to change how your tone is produced. A great mm -hmm. example of that is changing the angle of your pick, pick as you pick as you strike, uh, and it's difficult to do. Mm -hmm. It is. It because is because because you're going to want to go for what feels the most natural. It's funny, man. I just had this discussion today. Um, I may pick down. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of guys are kind of pick neutral. That's sort of that's sort of your Steve Morse, maybe Eric Johnson a little bit, but you know. The pick, pick neutral, I'm definitely a pick down. A lot of guys are pick up. Mm -hmm. And I just, for me, that is nearly impossible to do. Uh -huh. you know, but it creates a completely different tone. Right. I used to use a pick that had an angled tip so that I could oh, be really? picked down and it would strike the string flat, which gave a very different tone than a slightly angled pick. Wow. And I, think, I, think we, I think Dunlop still makes that pick. It's no a, kidding. It's a speed pick, I think it's called. Oh, wow. I didn't use for the speed pick reason. Of yeah, what, yeah, but, right. Uh, yeah. yeah, but yeah, changing the angle of how, it's, of how the pick's right. Well, see, and for me, like I hardly have any of the tip sticking out of the pick at all. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just almost invisible, just so it'll, so it'll brush. Right. You know, I still I do a little rotation, a little wrist rotation, a little thumb rotation, but for the, you know, and and also do the hybrid picking thing. But but for the most part, I'm finding that just as little surface touching as possible. Right. You know. And that but that creates a different tone. Mhm. Mm because I you know, the minute I pick up a heavy heavy pick and get just a little more of the pick sticking out, it sounds completely different. Right. Right. It's also surprising the what pick you use, the difference that it makes. Yeah. I got really into, for a couple of NAMM shows, I was just wandering the floor of the NAMM show and yeah. picking up every pick I could get my hands right, on. I'd come right. home with literally a handful yeah. of picks. <laughs> yeah. And then my wife started buying me picks, specialized picks for oh, that's gifts. Cool. So, you know, yeah. like an agate pick and yeah. different metal picks and wood quartz. I brought some metal picks yeah. back from Japan when I was visiting over there one time. And quartz yeah. and different types. I've got rosewood picks. I've got uh, yeah. uh, different types of really dense wood picks and things. Yeah. And yeah. It's really fun. It is, To compare man. both the, the thickness of the pick mm -hmm. and the material that the pick is made out of. Oh, my gosh, and the edge. Mm -hmm. The shape of the edge is, is almost everything. I mean, right. really, because, uh, you know, if it's, if it's really super, if it's super rounded, it's going to be smooth. If there's a, just a little sharp edge on it, man, you're going to get, you know, you're going to get that scrape as it goes by. That's another different sound completely. Right. And I think sometimes... Uh, some players will think that you're just getting overly tweaky. If you worry about that kind of stuff, you should just grab a pick and play. But think about, again, a, a, a woodwind player. Mm -hmm. They focus on their mouthpiece. Mm -hmm. They are working on that reed, the reed. to get oh my it gosh. perfect. Yeah. A violin player will work on that attack on their, on their bow and things, or a fiddle player or whatever. Exactly, exactly. I mean, and, the bow, and just think how important the bow is. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, just the bow itself. Not, not that your pick is a bow, but you know what I mean? Right. It's that same kind of attitude. That's what's striking the string. And the point isn't to mess with that for the sake of me messing with it. Yeah. The point is to mess with it, to, to experiment, to find the best tone for yourself, the right. thing that's going to give you what you want. Right, yeah, the best feel and the best tone. And, you're, and if you're comfortable, you're going to play your best. Right, right, and the notes are going to be pure, mm -hmm. and you're going to get better sound quality out of the whole rest of your rig. Yep. And I guess that really translates, again, it's not one of our tone tips, but I've also spent some time experimenting with different strings, both sure. different gauges and different manufacturers. Sure. Oh, yeah, because every different formula sounds and feels different, and it gets back to that. Mm-hmm. Yep. I've even been known to change strings for different parts. So you put a really bright string on yeah. for a particular part, and then mm -hmm. maybe you switch to flat wounds for something else. Or yeah. You, you know, or, or be, uh, be kind of tailoring... Yeah. That overall response. Not on stage, of course. Right. <laughs> Not in the <laughs> middle of the song. Hold it. <laughs> but, but yeah, that, now, see, now that's interesting, though, because I'll do that with guitars. Some guitars are like, this is a nine. This is a set of nines. Mm -hmm. This is a set of tens. This is a set of twelves. This is, these are flat rounds. These are half rounds. Sure. You know, definitely. Yeah, and you can specialize your guitars yeah. that way and yeah. match them to a... For a while, I used to always put the same strings on guitars that they came with. So if it was a Gibson, it would come with bright wires, and right. I always put bright wires right. on it. If it was a fender, it came with bullets, and you'd put, yeah. you know, whatever it might, might, might have been, but I don't do that any longer. Yeah. I've, I've since found yeah. more straight-ahead strings that work for particular things, but I right. do keep a set of flat wands around, and I'll put those on my 335 when I want a particular tone out of that. Oh, yeah. And I've got a brighter formulation of a round wound, mm -hmm. and sometimes I'll stick on a darker guitar Interesting. just to uh, bring out the top end just a little yeah. bit. Yeah. Again, back to the tweaking thing. Yep, exactly. 
but it gets you the tonal results you want. So mm -hmm. I don't consider it being too tweaky. Nah, not at all. So we've talked about practice, but really the point isn't practice. The point isn't the gear. The point is to get on stage and make music with it. And it is amazing how your perception and your concept of tone will change when you take that rig and set it up on a stage and play with other musicians. Mm -hmm. In the heat of battle. Mm -hmm. yeah. Exactly. What works in the bedroom, mm. you know, or the practice room, yeah, or wherever right. you're rehearsing right. hall even. Uh, right. You know, when you take it out on stage, it just might not do it. Yep, might be a totally different thing, and it's going to be the sound of the room. It's going to be the interaction of the other players, um, your instrumentation, mm -hmm. uh, certainly the songs you're playing, the material you're playing, but, but uh, you know, whether if you've got another guitar player, you guys have got to figure out tones that complement each other. Mm -hmm. You know, if you've got a keyboard player, you don't want to be playing in the same register he's playing in, and oh yeah, it's All that stuff a makes whole a big different difference. Thing. Yeah, it does. It, it's so easy to uh, be practicing along with a, uh, I'll call it a record at yeah. home, and uh, you know, you've got your tone dialed in, and it's got yeah. a ton of gain, and a ton of delay, and a ton mm -hmm. of reverb, and maybe yeah. some modulation of things right. going on. Right. Sounds incredible when you're in the room playing by yourself, mm -hmm. take that on stage, and that, that tone's just gone. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't translate at all. It's washy, and it's too low end, and mm -hmm. there's all the sparkly high end, but there's no mids where the guitar really lives, and you can't hear it. And yeah. Right, right. Yeah. We were talking the other day, uh, you like to have reverb on your amp, and sure. you know, have, have, have a nice little ambience there, mm -hmm. but you were saying the other day that you've been turning the reverb off on your amp when you're I, playing. I have. I put a foot switch out there. I, I figured out that on, on my amp, um, the, you know, that uh, that my channel switching foot switch will also work to switch my reverb off. Hmm. So I was, I've just been doing that. I've been shutting the reverb off sometimes and just playing completely dry. And what does that change it's just you? It's just astounding. It, it, it cleans up the articulation. I mean, there's a lot of times where you want spaciousness and you want the notes to really be connected. But man, when you need something to be super staccato or if you need something to be really articulate or if you just really want to jump out of the mix, man, just ax the reverb. Hmm. It's amazing. Gives you a lot more presence. Yeah, it does. Uh, I was really surprised. Right, and the same thing with delay. Yeah. Anything that's going to add ambience yep. and certainly a modulation mm -hmm. effect will tend to drop yeah. that presence back a notch. Sure. You know, it adds sure. width, yeah. but it pushes your back just mm -hmm. a little, little bit as well. And that's something that, again, you don't hear so much in, in uh, rehearsal or, you know, yeah. with rehearsal with a band maybe, but, uh, you know, when you're practicing by uh, yourself. When you're practicing by yourself, no, because you're isolated and you're listening to you and you're focused just on you and what you're doing. Right. And not how it fits in the whole. The other aspect of that from a practice standpoint is it's very easy to practice with a ton of effects on your tone yeah. and with high gain yeah. and to miss. Yeah, a lot of what's happening mm -hmm. because it's covering up. Yep, what's what's going on there? So yep. I actually tend to practice a lot with my guitar unplugged. Yeah, not even plugged into an amp because I figure if it sounds good, just playing on mm -hmm. the unplugged guitar when I plug it into an amp. Of course, I plug into an amp because sure. you have to hear it that way as well. Sure. But a lot of my my especially technique practice and things mm -hmm. is with just the unplugged guitar, so I can hear how clean it is. Right, right, and that gets back to that practicing with intent. Mm -hmm. You know, because you are you are listening to the sound of the instrument and the sound that your hands are making on the instrument. Right, absolutely. Totally makes sense. So there you have 10 tips plus some extra stuff thrown in there for ways to get better tone during 2017. There's some gear stuff there, there's some music stuff there, lots of things go into creating a tone. We've missed one important one. We have. What would What's it be? That? I don't know. I can't imagine, Mitch. What would it be? What would it be? I Playing in tune. Ah, there is nothing that destroys tune. a tone faster than being out, being out of tune. Out of tune. Oh man, you're yeah. You're either in tune or you're not. Yes, there is there no is really close. no middle ground. <laughs> close is for hand grenades and horseshoes, not tuning. Something like that. Yeah. yeah right. <laughs> and there's no excuse anymore. No. Clip-on tuners, floor oh, tuners, built-in yeah. tuners, oh, and amplifiers. God. Everything's got a tuner in it. Yeah. There's just no no that. reason to not be yeah. in, in tune anymore. Yeah. And I, I admit I'm guilty. I'll I'll slip out of tune now and then. <laughs> but uh, you know, it's certainly something that. If you want to sound your best, you got to be in tune. Yeah. Yeah. So there you have it. Great ways to improve your tone during 2017. If you have questions on these, you want to learn more about them, talk to your Sweetwater sales engineer, check out our Guitars and Gears video, and have a great toneful and tuneful 2017. On behalf of Don Carr and myself, thanks for joining us for Sweetwater's Guitars and Gear. I'm Mitch Gallagher.